I can still remember it clearly, all these years later. It was 1981 or 82. I'm not entirely sure, but it was November. That, I do recall, late November. Winter had already crept in. You could feel the encroaching ice in the air, stabbing at your lungs when the sun fell. I, at the time, was sheriff of a small town that sat near the northern border. A town called Kendall started there around 1969 and became sheriff in 73. But that's beside the point. I'm retired now, been for a number of years, and often I get asked by friends or even my grandchildren to hear stories from those days, of which I have plenty. What is the craziest thing you ever did as a cop? My granddaughter asks that one a lot. You ever been scared? Ever had to use your gun? Usually I tell the same few stories about the time I was shot at or the idiots that took me on chases up and down the highway. They're innocent enough for them, which makes me look like a hero and nobody ever gets hurt in the end. But the truth is, the thing that always stuck with me was nothing like that. Nothing so simple as some thug with a pistol or a junked up teenager stealing a car. Something that profoundly moved me in a way that no man should ever be moved. It began one morning, a gray cloudy day, when I arrived at the station to find a call had been left for us. It was from a young man named Jonathan, an Algonquin native whose father I had known well a few years back. He managed a small stable of horses that he would lend to officers if we needed to mount up. Jonathan said something happened to one of the horses, but he didn't explain exactly what, and said he needed someone there as soon as possible. He sounded distressed, and there was something ominous to his voice. I loaded up and set off his way. About an hour out from the highway, he lived on reservation land, and my mind immediately ran to the thought of a recent tragedy. A group of hikers had gone to camp up in the reservation, all of whom were still missing all these weeks later. I agreed to go up and meet with them, and took off in the police pickup, in case the terrain got hairy. He lived in a small home pushed up at the edge of the forest line, and hidden from the highway by tall brush. My truck pushed its way up his dirt road and I arrived at the property. I had never been this far before. Whenever we came to pick up a mount, they would always be waiting for us on the road. It was in poor but stable condition and there was a dark green pickup truck parked at the bottom of a long steep hill and I parked beside it. I could see the stables for the horses behind the home but no sign of the horses themselves. It was a hand-built cabin with modern amenities, presumably installed by the man's father years ago. I remember the old man well. He was quiet and spiritual, a man of tradition, always showed respect to those around him, and never started any trouble. He died some years back, and I knew the boy took it hard. In fact, I believe the last time I saw him was at the man's funeral. He'd grown now, I thought as I climbed the slope. I was near heaving by the time I walked up to the rickety steps of the cabin. I rapped on the old cabin door. There was no answer. Suddenly, I began to intake a foul odor. It attacked my nose and caused me to recoil. I called out and received an answer from behind the house. I found him in a hole by the fields, and next to him, a desecrated corpse of one of his horses. Christ, I said, what the hell went on here? I found him like this, out by the forests. I don't know what happened. I didn't know the boy well, but I could sense an edge to his voice, as if he had been up for days. He took pieces of the horse and drug them to the hole and began to fill it. 
I grabbed a shovel and helped, saying nothing all the while. It looked to be some kind of bear that got a hold of the poor animal, but he didn't seem to think so. There's something in these woods, Sheriff. Something out there, watching the property. He spoke as if he had been waiting a long time to tell this story. I began to notice it a few weeks ago. I saw it standing still amongst the cedars. It? I said. What is it? Some kind of bear? No, nothing like that. There's a spirit out there. I've seen it. I wasn't a believer of stories and myths that the Algonquin often spoke of, but the look and sound of the young man was deeply concerning. Is everything alright, son? You look pale and sick. You need to sit down for a while. He didn't listen, and so I asked him where and when he found the horse. After I began to feel its presence, I stopped letting the horses free in the fields. I didn't want them anywhere near those trees, but he escaped in the middle of the night, and I woke up to him screaming. He was sweating profusely. I heard his pained cries echo in the darkness, and I heard something behind it, some unholy rasp, unlike the sound of any bear or predator in these woods. His wide-eyed expression added discomfort to an already off-putting story. I refused to go out in that darkness with that thing, and I waited until sunrise to go check its body, and I found it there in pieces across the lawn, bite marks all over it. He continued to tell me about the things he'd seen. He described the weather growing cold, much colder than it already was, and he told me of the sight of something that resembled a tall man sitting just out of view in the trees. How it had never moved into the light, and its inhuman cries that would call to him. They sounded like the ravings of a madman. Perhaps the isolation he had was getting to him. Perhaps he was using and in the middle of a bad binge. Anything I could think of to rationalize the situation. The mutilated horse was a different story, a very real concern. Writing it off as a bear mauling would be easy, but I never knew one that would kill and leave the prey to rot in mangled pieces like this. It simply didn't match their behavior. He stopped talking suddenly, jerking his head back and looking at the tree line as if he heard something, but there was no sound or sight to accompany the action. I asked him if he had gotten sleep lately, and he admitted it had been some time since he had rested for more than a couple of hours at a time. I grabbed the shaking man by his shoulders and led him to his door. You should try and get some sleep tonight, son, I said. Go into a hotel in town. It would do wonders. I can't. I cannot leave my horses unattended with that thing out there. I offered instead a helping hand. I told him I would come back before the sunset and stay with him overnight so he could rest his eyes as I watched over his stable. He and his father had been longtime friends to us, and I figured it was the least I could do. Some sleep would serve him well. He thought for some time before accepting the offer, perhaps only because he saw little other choice. I shook his hand and directed him inside, told him to sit tight and relax for the day, and to call immediately if anything fell off again. So I set off back into my truck and headed on down to the station. I told my secretary about what I'd be doing and requisitioned a shotgun. I didn't believe any monster stories, but anything capable of doing that to a horse could do worse to a man and I decided to not take any chances. Before night began to fall, I went home and told the family what I'd be doing. My wife immediately didn't take a liking to any of it. She begged me not to go, and the children looked at me terrified, as they'd been eavesdropping on the whole conversation. Convincing them took longer than I thought. 
and the sun was already mid-set by the time I could finally head out. I got to the reservation as the last of the gray faded and began to exchange for a pitch of darkness. The truck lights cut through the dark as I navigated the drive path and pulled into the small lot at the bottom of the hill. I felt something was wrong immediately. Jonathan's truck was nowhere to be found. I wrote it off. I figured it may be parked elsewhere, and if not, then checking the property was the least I could do regardless. The outside of the home was lit dimly by an old oil lantern, and the inside had a faint glow of light emanating from the side windows. But this was not very reassuring. There was something gothic about the lighting, something off-putting. I never let my nerves get the better of me, so I took the shotgun from the back and slung it over my shoulder and checked the revolver at my side, just to get a feel. I grabbed my flashlight and began up a long hill. The walk felt like an eternity. The visibility was fading quickly and I lost sight of the tree line before I was even halfway up. It wasn't until I was in the darkness that I realized how much the story had gotten to me. Every few steps, I stopped and listened out into the darkness, but I received no feedback. I navigated by oil light, like some wise man following the stars in the vast desert, and eventually I arrived at the porch. I noticed the door ajar and I slung the shotgun around and held it in my arm and cautiously stepped towards it. I called out for Jonathan, but I heard nothing. I pushed the door in further and began to step into the main room. It was covered in travel decor and sparsely filled. An old animal hide blanket on some retro sofa and a spectacularly woven dream catcher placed above it. Suddenly, the horrific stench returned. It filled my nostrils and caused me to almost gag. It was much stronger now and smelt clearly of death. I had to step back outside. I took a moment to recover and breathe. I pulled the shotgun up and stepped back in to comb the room. To my right was a small kitchen. The sink faucet was running lightly and there was a cast iron pan with something charred inside. It was still warm. There were two rooms on either end of a small hallway adjoining the living room. I worked my way down, checking each room with great caution. Both were empty. The stench lingered about and unease set in. I thought for a moment and I remembered the horses. I ran out the back door and towards the stables. I shined my flashlight into the darkness to find they were all empty. No trace of anything. The doors were either left open or broken off their hinges, and it seemed the animals were long gone now. My heart was pounding, and I was questioning whether to leave or even to call in backup. I was startled by the loud cry of an owl that was sitting atop the trestle of the stable, a grand white bird at least six pounds. It stared at me with cold eyes before spreading its wings and taking off. The tree line was now eclipsing the rising moon and a dim gray hue fell over the property, increasing my visibility by just a few feet. I slowly began to circle the house, checking the outside and occasionally flashing my light out into the field. My flashlight was strong, but no matter where it shone, the light could not penetrate into the forests. A black void laying just beyond the edge. I felt the temperature drop rapidly, a bone chilling cold accompanied by a harsh wind. I buttoned my coat and continued on. I found a pair of cellar doors locked with a chain. One of them had a hole busted out. From the inside 
and what looked like a couple bullet holes going in around it. I tried shining my light into the hole. All I could see was a set of dirty stained concrete stairs leading into more darkness. My fixation on it was interrupted by an odd sound, an unnatural rustle. I turned and shined the light back into the blackness, but there was nothing to greet me. I probed the light slowly across the trees, letting my eyes adjust and take in what I saw before moving along. The flashlight didn't seem to be much help. Its effectiveness waned about 100 feet out, and all light was sucked away as it met the forest. I stopped on an odd looking thing, a thin gray tree that stood out from the rest. It looked dead, sitting amongst a patch of shrubbery. I had not noticed it when I was there earlier, and I studied it closely, or as best I could. Immediately, something seemed off. It didn't look like anything that grew in this region, or any other region for that matter. It looked almost alien. Four sharp, malnourished branches bent and hung low to the ground, and its base was rigid and sunken in. Unlike the other plants, it didn't seem affected by the wind. It stood eerily unmoved. I spent some time trying to match it to something familiar to me, but then it moved. It stood tall and turned, sprinting into the forest, moving with such an unearthly speed that it instantly became a blur, and half a second later it was gone. I had no time to register what I had just seen. I jumped in shock and instinctively fired my gun but it was gone well before the clatter of the buckshot reached the shrubbery. It was so sudden that for a moment I questioned if what I saw was even real. I had in my head only the remnants of some horrid face that briefly disgraced my vision. There were no details that registered, only a feeling of dread that ran down my spine. I backed against the house Shotgun still leveled on my shoulder. Scanning the forest, I didn't know what to do. Despite the tree line being about a hundred yards out, the speed in which it ran led me to believe it could close the distance before I could even react. I pressed myself against the cabin and began to slowly circle out, never taking my eyes off the forest. I would only walk a few feet before stopping and keeping a keen ear, repeating again and again as I made my way around the front of the cabin. After several painstaking minutes, I arrived. I stepped over the railings onto the porch, limiting the directions the thing could come at me from. The brief moment I needed to turn and climb, I entered into a panic. I scuffled over the rail and quickly turned to scan the trees again. Nothing. I took a few deep breaths and pressed my back up to the wall again. Suddenly, I heard a ghostly howl that came in tandem with the wind, almost masked and carried by it. I couldn't tell what direction it came from. It cried again, and then, silence. The cold was now unbearable, and I needed to make a break for my truck which thankfully remained unperturbed at the bottom of the hill. I knew I couldn't wait there forever. As shaken as I was, I needed to leave. I began my tactic again, walking to the base of the hill and listening. The ground was wet and slick. I had to go much slower than I'd like to, so I could avoid tumbling down. I was naked, completely surrounded by darkness, and going off of nothing but hope. Most of the trip down was without incident, and I was finally near the bottom. Before I could lower my guard, I heard the howl again. It seemed close. I swung my weapon and light at where I thought the sound originated from, and my heart sank when I saw 
a large pair of eyes staring directly at me. It was a large owl, sitting atop a tree and looking down at me intently. I took a sigh of relief, but was interrupted when I heard rapid trampling from behind me, followed by a loud bump against the metal of my truck. I turned again to find my vehicle swaying slightly. The creaking of the struts was the only sound now. I dropped to my knees, investigating under the vehicle. Nothing. I circled and checked the bed. Empty. I wasted no more time. I got into the car and turned the ignition. Part of me didn't believe it would turn on, but it did. I thanked God and began to reverse out. I took one last look at the house. The lights had gone out, but in the pale yellow glow of my truck's lights, I thought I could see it, watching me from the windows inside. But there was no way to be sure. My adrenaline wouldn't let me linger any longer, and I drove off as fast as I could, out onto the highway and towards home. The scene was something that would never leave my mind. But as unreal and haunting as that night was, the discoveries made the next day had stuck with me far longer. I kept what I saw to myself. Part of me didn't even believe it, so I knew there would be little luck in explaining to others. I simply said Jonathan and his horses were nowhere to be found. John's green truck was found on the side of the highway about 10 miles south. It careened off into a ditch and was totaled. There was dried blood on the dash and a stained bowie knife sat in the grass. Various articles of clothing were on the ground and two sets of tracks led into the forest, one of them barefoot. This had been enough to acquire a search warrant of Jonathan's property, so I, along with my deputies, went to investigate the property that afternoon. The house was untouched, nothing misplaced or unusual since the previous night. I made an effort to separate myself from the others for a moment, searching the grass to grab and pocket the shell that I had fired. My priority was to check those cellar doors, and after cutting the chain and walking down, I had found the source of the awful stench. Scattered remains of bone with human teeth marks riddled all over them, blood-stained chains and cuffs nailed to the wall. My mind immediately jumped to the thought of those missing hikers, and my fear rang true as the only DNA that could be extracted matched with that of Sally Miller, one of the women who disappeared. It was by far the most wretched thing I'd ever encountered in my work, and it's not one that anyone at the station likes to speak of. Jonathan was never found. What was left of him and his story ended with those tracks in those woods. I had only brought up the incident that night to my wife and a friend at the station. Martha was deeply concerned and she had no issues believing me. She was always extra cautious around the forest scents, never letting the children near it. And my longtime friend Bernard told me it must have been some sickly, emaciated bear, and I never argued the point. I didn't know what I saw, but I know what I didn't see. I didn't see any creature of God sitting in those woods. The image of that mistaken tree has appeared in more than a few of my nightmares, and I never seem to get a clear picture whenever I think back on it. Not that I often try. I retired, never fully closing the book on the case. And in truth, part of me never really wanted to. Jonathan was long gone, and whatever answers there may be, I had no interest in knowing. Some things are best left unsaid, unanswered. The mythical evil 
that lay in those woods seemed too pale in comparison to the evils in the heart of what I believed was a good man. <laughs>